All right, guys, let's get to the point here. There's no doubt that the type of hunts that I talk about on this channel, over-the-counter elk hunts, easy to draw mule deer tags, all of that great stuff, all the big adventure hunts on public land, there's just more demand for them, right? And you guys are seeing that out there. I've talked about this in other videos. You can check them out. I've talked about in the context of, you know, who created that demand. Was it Joe Rogan? Was it Cam Haynes? Is it partially my fault? Am I involved in this debacle of pressure and now it's competitive to get tags and this public land thing just sucks? Okay, so the reality is when it comes to public land, the biggest issue is actually not demand. The bigger issue right now is the amount of supply. And really, I'm talking about the trend. If you look at the trend on public land, you look at the politics of the state game departments, if you look at all of that and you put a chart, right? You put growing supply of big game hunts to the general public on one side of the paper, you put shrinking supply of big game hunts on the other side of the paper, and you write down all the current factors, all the current trends. What you're gonna see is the negative column, the declining supply of hunts via public land, via state game departments, for a multitude of reasons that I could talk about for like 10 hours. There's way more on that side of the paper, right? For sure, there's going to continue to be more competition to get those sort of hunts. And unfortunately, there's going to be less of those hunts. And that's the big issue. So without a doubt, one of the things that I think a Western hunter should really start to think about across the economic spectrum, you could be a guy with $100 million or you could be a guy that's making 70 or 80 grand a year. I still think you should consider private land options. And in particular, I think you should consider developing private land opportunities for both mule deer, elk, and bear to some extent, really. There's, there's a great opportunity right now in Colorado to hook up with landowners and hunt bears. There's no doubt that opportunity exists. All of those, if you're a rational person, I think it makes sense. I actually think it makes sense even when you account for the economics of it, that you're gonna have to pay somebody for that access, I still think it makes sense to integrate that into your plan. So that's what this video is all about. I actually got prompted to do this video from a question that came through my membership site. You guys can check out the details of that site. I launched it a couple weeks back. I think I've got 40 or 50 members now. I'm doing four live streams for that group where I specifically answer their specific questions. I'm also doing a few Zoom calls every month with the group. We're having a lot of fun. There's a private Facebook group. I really try to directly answer everybody's question that's in that group. So if you have interest in that, you can go to my website, pursuitwithcliff.com backslash membership, check it out, no pressure at all. It's really more of direct contact with me if you need or want me to answer specific questions on the hunting planning and strategy side of things. And don't worry guys, I'm still gonna put out as much content as possible on YouTube on the same topics. There, there's just a little more personal touch. So there's the sales pitch, let's jump into this topic. All right, so the first thing that you've gotta get over is the short term wanting a deal on private land in Colorado, Montana, Wyoming, wherever. And you have to understand the overarching dynamic in those areas, and this has very much shifted in the last decade, the last 20 years, during a chunk of my hunting lifespan as a private hunter and somebody in the business, right? I spent a lot of time in my business trying to acquire hunting leases, that sort of thing, so I see both sides of this. But what I can tell you is there's been a big macro shift in most of these Western states. And what I mean by that is when I was a kid in the 80s, early 90s, most ranchers and ag guys, the hunting component actually had like significant economics relative to their asset base, right? So a guy might have a ranch that was worth three or four million dollars and he was making 10, 15, 20 grand off the hunting. That could be a significant chunk of his income and as it related to the asset base it was important you know back in the 80s there was guys that were buying these ranches in colorado they were cattle guys so they were buying them just like a lot of people look at normal real estate now they were buying them they had a mortgage on them they operated them they worked hard they worked to pay them off right that actually existed but that has gone away let's say colorado for instance everybody sees these huge numbers that are paid for leases, right? And they're like, oh, I'd never pay that. But if you really look at it relative to the asset base, 
it's way less than it used to be. That ratio is way less than it used to be. And what that means is it means it's less significant to the owner's decision process. Let me, let me dive a little bit deeper because you got to understand this concept in order to figure this out for your long-term hunting strategies. So an individual now who back in the day, you know, was getting 20 grand to lease his $5 million ranch. Now that same individual or maybe a different individual who's acquired the same place over the years or whatever. Now that ranch is worth 50 million or $60 million. And yeah, maybe the lease has gotten, you know, it's been inflation adjusted a little bit. Now they're making 35 grand or 40 grand off of the lease, the hunting rights, right? Or, you know, whatever. An outfitter's paying them that. Private individuals are paying them that. You know, whatever, however they're getting paid for the hunting, right? But think about that ratio, right? You've got like 10 or 15 grand over 5 million, or now you've got, you know, 40 grand or 35 grand over 50 million. You can see that there's a huge relative difference. And the reality is the culture is different also. A lot of these really good hunting ranches in Colorado in good chunks of property, even small pieces, 500 acres here, 200 acres here, 1,000 acres here. In the West, that's nothing. You know, hunting this kind of country, still that's nothing unless it's a you know specific kind of topography, you know, or you know the area and they go through that, whatever. We'll, we'll get into that a little more. But my point is the culture of ownership of these ranches has very much changed. The owners now are not concerned as much about that cash flow, right? They may still want it. They may still want the places hunted. Contrary to what you hear out there it, within this cultural topic on ownership of these ranches, the reality is the majority of these ranches that I've seen historically getting hunted, they're still getting hunted. It's just the ownership is not as concerned about the hunters, right? They're not as concerned about that lease. So why does all this matter? It matters because I'm going to give you the biggest piece of advice on this kind of thing on these species. This is not whitetail back east. This is not whitetail in the Midwest. And it's all based on this cultural difference, this relative economic value I'm talking about, right? You're not gonna be real productive essentially trying to poach leases or poach access from other hunters or outfitters. And the reason is, is if those landowners are comfortable with those people who are now hunting their place, if you come to them with an offer that's 50% more or 100% more, if they're happy with who's hunting their place right now, they're not gonna respond to you or they're just gonna tell you no. And I can tell you that this is the case even as an outfitter. And, and I say that in the context that when I was outfitting, I was always looking for places to expand my business. And I can't tell you for sure because I can't read people's minds, but generally I was the neighbor to a lot of these people. I feel like I had a good reputation. I was a trustworthy individual. So I even had that relationship and still I found tremendous obstacles when it came to trying to acquire leases, acquire hunting access where there had been historical hunters that those ranchers were happy with. So that's a long-winded way of saying that the key thing here is that this isn't a free market where money talks, right? You have to have a long-term perspective on it because the other thing, the dynamic that I just described means is it means that, look, the people right now who have incredible access to hunting places in Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, or whatever, a lot of them are actually paying way below the market rate for that access, right? So the hard part of this is that it's hard for you as somebody wanting to get access to go out there and just you know hit the market up and pay X amount of dollars for access. That's difficult, but once you're in, and once you do a good job of maintaining that relationship with that farmer or rancher, the reality is they're more concerned about you, how you treat their wildlife, how you treat their property, you know, how you are as a friend, how you respect the rules on their place, how you respect their privacy. They're much more interested in that than money. So that results in long-term relationships where people are getting a great deal. So with that idea in mind, we have to think about strategy, right? Like, okay, Cliff, like this is great for the people in, but the guys on the out are pretty much fucked, right? Well, not really. 
The, the key takeaway I'll tell you is you gotta be strategic, right? You have to be opportunistic. If one of your hunting buddies calls you up and says, hey man, for the last 30 years, we've been going to XYZ Ranch out in Colorado, we have a good time. You know, we, there's six of us who have done it historically, but Jim Bob is just getting too old. We're looking for somebody to fill the spot. It turns out Jim Bob wants, his, wants to give his spot to his son, but this year he can't go. Why don't you join us just for the year? It's not going to be a long-term deal, but just for the year, come out and check it out. When you get that kind of opportunity, grasp it, okay? Because even if it seems short-term, a lot of times you become a part of those groups and you basically inherit that access, doing a good job as a hunting partner. I'll stick a video up here on hunting partners, go check it out. But anyways, you know, being a good hunting partner, being a good team member, that sort of thing, eventually other spots will open in that group and you'll get your chance to have a long-term access to that ranch. It sounds crazy and it seems like a weird cultural dynamic, but that's how a lot of this access transfers in these western states is the landowner trusts a group and the group basically manages who takes the spots right who gets the tags if there's tag availability that sort of thing and i'll mention that right now i'll specifically pound on colorado a little bit but this goes for new mexico and other places with landowner programs and in colorado just a brief overview there's a voucher program where landowners can get vouchers, they can put in for their own draw, they can get vouchers for tags, and then they can sell those tags to hunters. But in Colorado, there's also tags, and you'll see this in cow elk a lot, you'll see this in bears a lot, and you'll see this some in mule deer. There will be tags for certain units that are private land only that you can put in directly as public. You don't have to go through the landowner. So what that means is access to these places actually gives you a much better chance to be able to hunt every year or more often. It depends on the unit, right? Um, you know, landowner tags can be hard for the landowner to get in a unit that's really high points, but he may be getting them at a much steadier pace than the public will, right? Or that private land tag only will have the same dynamic, right? You can draw it every other year, whereas everybody that's got to hunt the public in that unit, they can only draw the tag once every 10 years. So that exists also. That's commonplace in a lot of states. Oregon, also very similar if you look into their landowner program. So this is another benefit of the private land access deal is that you can plan long-term if you have that type of access. Now, I will note this, and I noted this uh, in the group when I discussed it. There's a little, a little trick to Colorado, you have to understand when it comes to these vouchers, and then I'm, I'm gonna leave this topic, I'll get back to what I was talking about, but on the vouchers in Colorado that go through landowners, all the vouchers as of now, unless something has changed and I'm not privy to it, all the vouchers that come through a landowner, they give you, the hunter, the right to hunt that private land that the voucher was dedicated to, right? So the reason this is important is a lot of time, the Colorado vouchers, right, to get tags, they will allow you to get tags where you can only hunt the private land, but also some of these vouchers, and these are the ones that are the higher value ones, there's some vouchers in units that allow you to hunt the private land, but also all the public land too, right? So that's where, that's where the big money is in the vouchers in the landowner program in Colorado. But all the tags, right? are supposed to allow you to hunt that private land that the tag was distributed through, right? But one of the dirty secrets in Colorado is the landowners know this or who, whoever's managing the tags for the landowner, they know this, but they really don't want you to hunt that private land, right? So a lot of times, a lot of times they'll be forthright, they'll be like, hey, it says on the tag or the voucher that you can hunt the private land, but you know the owners really don't want that or I don't really want that. We've got, uh, we've got other things going on during the hunting season. I really encourage you, wink, wink. I'd really like you, wink, wink, to only hunt the public land. All right, whatever. It doesn't, all that doesn't matter. I just described that dynamic because it's important for you to understand something that I've seen people do and it destroys relationships and it causes horrible hunts, right? I understand that the landowner should allow you access to that private ranch according to the landowner program in Colorado, the voucher program. But if they are not clear that they understand that that's a part of the deal, do not buy the tag and then go in there and start hunting that place and claim and, and then show them the tag and say, hey, 
you know, it says I can hunt your private land. It doesn't matter what you say at this point. I've seen people try to do that and there's all sorts of different ways that turns out in misery. So if you're gonna do the voucher thing, you're gonna buy vouchers in Colorado, make sure that's very clear with the private landowner that, hey, I understand I can hunt the, hunt the private property that this tag came through. Are we all on the same page? Make sure you have that discussion. A lot of times it won't matter because a lot of these vouchers that are unit wide, they've been put through on like a, you know, a 300 acre ranch where really, yeah, you might hunt that place, you know, one morning, but really you're going to use it to hunt the whole unit, right? So it doesn't matter in that case, but it's good to be straightforward on that. Now, where the hell was I on this whole topic? I got to, I got to get back to what I was talking about. Oh yeah, I was talking about the good old boy part of this, like wedging yourself into a group. The reason I mentioned this, because it's freaking obvious, right? Like, well, yeah, if I was given an awesome opportunity to go hunt an awesome ranch in Colorado, of course I'm going to do it. Well, I've seen this happen a lot, and a lot of times it happens with guys that are stretched to go hunting, right? You know, why don't you come do this with us? And you're like, yeah, I'm in. What's the what's the all-in cost? And they say $3,500, and your heart sinks, right? Like, holy shit, I can't afford $3,500. You got to look at it as a long-term thing because it comes back to the earlier dynamic. Most likely, first, in these, these good old boy situations, you're probably getting a deal right off the bat. Like, do your due diligence. Make sure you're not getting fucked or whatever else, right? But generally, it's probably worth the money. Those are the best deals in the hunting world right now. I can tell you that. But even if it's at market price, right? Like you look at it, you're like, man, it just doesn't seem like a, like a phenomenal deal. Like maybe, maybe they're shifting a little bit of the extra cost to me or something like that. Who knows, whatever, right? But my straightforward advice on this, if you're not getting hosed on that initial entry point into private land, do it. Stretch yourself a little bit thin and do that and look at it as a long-term investment. I don't know if I have to do like a disclosure on that. Like, you know how stock guys do? Like, this is an investment advice. Well, okay, obviously we're talking about hunting, so you're fucking blowing money anyways. But I'm telling you, if you want to be long-term focused about it, have a long-term view on this and view it as a long-term investment. Because what you're going to do is you're going to figure out how to make that extra $3,500. You're going to get into that group. All those guys are getting older like the, all of us, right? You're going to have a damn good time. Three or four years later, another guy's going to drop out of the group. They're not going to know who to replace him with. You're going to bring in your son or your best buddy. So now two of you are in the group, right? And then again, people are getting older and older. A couple more guys drop off. Now you help replace them. All of a sudden, you're the leader of the group. You've got the whole access under wraps. You've got the relationship with that landowner. That is is an awesome opportunity. I've seen it over and over. And the other thing is the economics. Okay, now you feel like you're getting a little bit ripped off at $3,500 this year. 10 years from now, now you're paying $3,800. It hasn't even gone up with inflation, let alone the market for this stuff is exploding. So you're paying $3,800. And it turns out now the market value for that opportunity is 15 grand. I've seen that all over Colorado in the last 10 years, right? There's guys paying $2,500 for stuff that I would have paid as an outfitter 10 grand for at least. So you have to view it that way. Have a long-term focus. There's other strategies around that too, right? I'm, and, and I'm not saying like to do anything malicious or that's untrustworthy or anything like that. What I'm saying is be open to all these opportunities and realize that it's probably going to pay off down the road because there's not an open market for access right now, right? That's the, that's the next point I want to talk about. There's no open access for hunting access in Colorado, Wyoming, or Montana because the owners know the value of those tags they have. They know the value of the access to the private land program that they have. They know the value of the access through their property into the wilderness area adjacent to it, into the forest service adjacent to it. They know all that value. Believe me, when a broker is selling a piece of property in one of these areas, they tend to know the nitty gritty of the hunting opportunities. And a lot of times they'll have it in a spreadsheet 
for potential buyers, right? So you're not gonna find landowners in these areas you know, that have hunting opportunities that don't know the value of what they have. You're not gonna snooker some guy into like, hey, can I hunt your place for 500 bucks when, you know, the opportunity is actually worth 3,500 bucks, right? A matter of fact, there's really not even a free market out there to pay the market value of $3,500, right? There's not those opportunities. It's just, they don't exist. I know a lot of states, it is like that. In Texas, it's a little more like that because there's just more leasing. There's a more commercialized environment. The hunting has a higher relative value versus the land value than it does in Colorado, that sort of thing, right? So it's a very different dynamic, but you have to consider that is that it's not about money just entering the market and finding something to lease up. It's not about that. You gotta be strategic about how you get in. So the last couple things I'll talk about is some strategy around establishing those long-term relationships with the ranchers, with the landowners, wherever you wanna hunt, right? Let's just say that you have no friends or maybe you just don't have any friends in the hunting world, right? So this scenario of you being invited on a hunt, just it's not gonna happen. So you need to figure out a way to source your own opportunities on this front. All the other stuff still applies, right? Have the long-term view, all of that applies. And, and all of that is still gonna be in your mindset, in your strategy for establishing these relationships and these uh, potential hunting access situations. But you've gotta source them yourself. So one of the generic ways to do it is to call the wildlife agencies in those areas and try to get to the enforcement guys in the region you're focusing. So I'm not talking about like, like don't just call Colorado you know, the fish and game guys there, the parks and wildlife guys, and just say, hey, I wanna to talk to an enforcement guy and because I'm looking for leases. Nah, you, you're not gonna get anywhere with that because even if you do end up talking to an enforcement guy, you know, a game warden or whatever they call them there, they have a funny name for them in Colorado, but they're basically game wardens. Those guys that are boots on the ground, if you just get a hold of one randomly and they know that you have no context of the area, they're not gonna waste their time. They're not gonna, they're not gonna push you toward, towards certain landowners or suggest this area or that place or whatever. They're not gonna do that, they're not gonna waste their time. Now, if you get to one and you know the specific drainage, you happen to know some of the private land around there, basically you've hunted it before, you've had your own boots on the ground, then when you talk to them, you might be able to get some information out of them. So, you wanna do that. Use Onyx, use whatever mapping software, Find the place that you want to hunt. Look at the different, know the big landowner names. You know, they're always under entities, but kind of know what we're, you know, what you're talking about, what you're looking at. Maybe really what you're looking for, and this is very valuable a lot of the time, is you're looking for access into chunks of public land where you need to just go through private land, that sort of thing, right? So you know the corners, you know all that kind of stuff, right? Then go figure out the enforcement person, boots on the ground, CPW, a, you know, game warden guy, figure out his contact information and go through the regional offices and try to get a hold of them and see if he has any suggestions on people that might be open to trespass fees. You know, it's good to start with that. You know, if you just call one of these guys and like, hey, I want to lease a 50,000 acre ranch, like there's just not that many of them in most of these regions. So you're better off just starting small, start the conversation that way. And a lot of times they can kind of bump you in to the right direction. Strategically, do not do this two weeks before a hunt that you have a tag for when these guys are crazy busy, right? So once you get in to August, basically, these guys are not gonna have the time to talk to you about this kind of shit. So you need to call them like right now, January, February, March, when it's less busy for them, make those calls now and try to get those contacts now and you'll have a lot better luck. But the reality is this is low probability stuff. This is like cold calling people trying to sell them shit, right? You're gonna get denied, no information, nine out of 10 times. You just gotta keep grinding and do your best, right? So that's one avenue of uh, information and getting pointed in the right direction of maybe somebody out there who has got a place that they're looking for new hunters on. Usually, if you hit on that, it's gonna be because somebody who's had the access, an outfitter or a private individual, a group of private in individuals, somehow they fuck something up. And a lot of times the game wardens are privy to that, right? Something has occurred on that place that was not good and therefore whoever is hunting there is going to lose their access or you know it's questionable, right? 
The game wardens are gonna know that. And a lot of times that's when they're more likely to suggest a landowner because they wanna help, they wanna help the landowner solve an issue, right? They're not gonna give you a landowner's contact information or tell you about, about a landowner. A lot of them are very careful about giving you landowner information, period. I'm not sure that they can, right? So, but they might suggest someone to try to contact, figure out, you can figure out how to get a, you know, get a hold of people. But the point, of, the point I'm saying is that the game wardens always have this contentious, I shouldn't say contentious, but kind of like a, a push-pull relationship with landowners, a push-pull relationship with the outfitters that are leasing you know, from landowners, all of that, because they have a job to do, but they're constantly interacting with these people, right? So if they can help a landowner out by being like, hey, call this guy up, he's having problems, like there's your, there's your way to get in, right? What they're not gonna do is know that, hey, Cliff has been leasing this ranch, those guys have a great relationship, both of them are easy for me as the game warden to deal with, like, okay, I'm gonna give this random person who called me the contact information so he can go in there, waste the landowner's time, potentially fuck something up for Cliff, and create a rift for me. These enforcement guys are not gonna do that. What you're looking for is the opportunities where the enforcement guy can help you and he can help his counterparts that he deals with during the hunting seasons or whatever. So long-winded approach to that avenue, but I think if you understand the overall dynamic, it'll actually help you when you're trying to establish these things. So the other option is, how do you just contact landowners directly, right? How do you know who to call? How do you get an in? A lot of people think that the best approach is that, hey, I've been on this hunt, you know, it's September 20th, I've been driving by this rancher's house, I've been driving past his center pivots, I've been hiking right next to his fence, I've been leaving my vehicle right next to his fence, I know this little corner where I'm sneaking into the public land in there, and I've been hunting it, got all my camo on, I've got my face painted, you know, I've been hunting it, I've been staying off his property, but I'm always walking right by, you know, right around his barns at five in the morning in the, you know, the wee bit of light, you know, every once in a while I scare his cats and scare his dogs, you know, but every time I come out of that public land behind his place, I come by the center pivots and there's a bunch of bulls out there bugling, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go up to his house and ask him if I can pay him 500 bucks to hunt those elk tomorrow. That is the worst approach. Because I can tell you the culture of these type of people, I've, you know, I grew up, I grew up as these type of people, right? Like, you know, I grew up within an ag family, within a ranching family. Yeah, outfitting too, but still, like this dynamic exists that I'm going to describe. Generally, they're not fans of you, okay? Particularly if you have a non-resident license plate, they don't recognize you, you've never talked to them in person. They're not, they, they're gonna deal with you because they know that you have the right to do that type of hunting. But if you're, if you're parking right on their fence line, walking their fence line, waking their dog up at five in the morning, they're generally not big fans of you, all right? I know that may seem like, oh, well, that's not fair. I'm not doing anything wrong. Doesn't matter because now you're asking them for something. And the other thing is, doesn't matter if you go up to somebody's house and he's got 90 mounts in his living room. When he opens the door, you look, oh, this guy's a hunter, awesome. He's gonna, he's gonna be supportive of me. It doesn't matter all of that. Those elk that you've been walking by, most likely either he hunts them himself, he has friends that wanna hunt them, you know, or, which is very common, even amongst guys that hunt a lot, he just likes seeing them, right? So you are asking something huge from him, okay? And you're asking it during the time when he's having to deal with hunters in general. He's got just, it's just kind of a negative feeling for a lot of these guys, right? You're probably not the first guy to come up to his place. So don't do that. So your best bet is one, be very cognizant of how you're hunting around private land. Be very careful where you park your vehicle, you know, where you walk in the morning, all of that stuff. And then eventually you're gonna run in to people who work at that ranch. A lot of times you're gonna run in to the owner and you're not even gonna know it. There's ranches in Colorado that I've leased or I've hunted next to, or I know the people just from family history, and literally the owner who's worth two, three hundred million dollars is driving around a four-wheeler and irrigating. That's pretty common, right? So eventually, if you're around, you're gonna run into these people, you're gonna have conversations. Just have a conversation about whatever. The you know, the country, you know, what you're doing, the hunt you've been doing, all of that stuff. People 
people don't mind that conversation, particularly if you're around and you're an outsider, right? They would like to know who you are and it's nice to have a short conversation and they can put a face to a vehicle that's parked right outside their land every night, that sort of thing. They like that, right? Of, of course, of course, use normal social norms and don't you know, interrupt them while they're trying to get stuff done or whatever, but eventually you have the opportunity to talk, about, talk to these people, share contact information, all of that. Don't ask them for anything in the moment, right? They know you're a hunter and they know you want access to the place, right? Or they know you would like that, right? That'd be something you enjoy. These guys are not naive to that, right? So don't worry about it. And then, same deal. Contact them this time of year, January, February, March, and then you can contact them. You can send them a note in the mail, a handwritten note. Say, hey, you know, this is Cliff. We met on the road. You know, we, we finished up the hunt. Me and my son finished up the hunt. We had a good time. Your place is beautiful. All that, all that public land behind your place is absolutely stunning. You know, I just wanted to mention to you that if you ever have any interest in leasing the ranch to hunters, or even if you're open to us paying you a trespass fee to go through that corner, man, it would save us a ton of hassle. Just think about it. Give me a call if you think it's something you'd entertain. Do that and your hit rate is gonna be much, much higher with these people. And it may not happen when you send the note, it may not happen when you leave the voicemail, but you go hunting out there the next year, they're gonna have got the note, they're gonna have gotten the voicemail, they're gonna see ya, and, that, and you know now you slowly build up the relationship. And the same dynamic exists. Most of them are gonna already have a deal with hunters, outfitters, whatever, or they're doing their own hunting, but things change, and now you're on the top of their mind. Another one I'll point out on this is I'm talking more like road-based hunts, right? Where you're kind of sneaking around all the private land, hunting, hunting those chunks of uh, public that are right up against the private land. Another situation that arises is these wilderness areas, right? So a lot of you are hunting wilderness areas, you're over-the-counter archery elk hunting or low-draw archery elk hunting, and you're up in these wilderness areas in September, and you run into the cattle guys because they're still trying to get cattle out of the high country. They're still working up there. You know the ranches that they're on. You can look at Onyx, right? Like almost all the cattle grazing permits, almost all of them in Colorado in particular, they're coming off of adjacent ranches. Look at the valley. Look where you would winter cattle. Look where you would calve cattle, right? They're going to be in those bottom valleys. You're going to see calving barns. You're going to see people working there, all of that. Those ranches, and a lot of these ranches are the ones that you guys would like, you know, trespass access to, you'd like to hunt. A lot of those ranches, and it could be little, little, little small ranches next to it where one of the ranch hand works or whatever that community, those little ranches are obvious. Look at the map, drive around, you're going to know where they're at. Those people generally have the grazing permits in the forest in the wilderness area. So, Here's a big one for you. If you're up there archery elk hunting and you run into cowboys, don't tell them how much you hate cattle grazing or you know you run into the sheep guy, you've been talking to the sheep herder, but you run into the guy that manages the whole sheep herd and you tell him, hey, like these range maggots drive me fucking crazy. Do not start the conversation like that because you're literally talking to one of your best access points to the potential of hunting private land, right? These individuals are either part of the family who owns a bunch of private land down there, know people who own the private land down there, work for them, or a lot of times the older guy that looks like he just rode out of the set of Yellowstone, he's the owner of the whole thing. So you're up there four miles in, he's up there you know, trying to search for a couple cows that he lost, and he's the owner of all those ranches down there. Have a good conversation with them, build up some rapport, trade contact information if, if it's appropriate, and build up that relationship over time. Believe me, that stuff goes a long way. So guys, the takeaway is, is all the deals are gonna be long-term, but if history repeats itself, which I think it's gonna be even more extreme, all this access is gonna go way, way up in value, particularly as the supply of hunts continues to decline or stay steady, and we have an increase of people that are into this type of hunting due to Rogan, Cam Haynes, me, total piece of shits like us, right? We ruined the whole thing. There's just too much demand for these type of hunts. Because of all that, all of this stuff is gonna be more extreme. If you can get into places, get some good hunting access, be a good partner with these landowners, do the right thing, 
I guarantee you, if you keep this, if you keep these situations for six, seven, ten years, you're going to be getting a ripping deal. But it's going to be a hard, difficult journey that you're going to have to slowly work on to get that original access. I hope you guys found this useful. If you've got a differing thought on this, you've got some thought on strategy, feel free to leave it down in the comments. If you got value out of the video, please like it and subscribe to the channel. If you want to do the membership thing, like I said, pursuitwithcliff.com backslash membership. I'll catch you guys later. Thanks for watching.